Welcome to this episode of Jadal English TV. Uh, today is Friday, 12th of April, 2024, and it's almost 12 days since Israel attacked Iran's consulate in Damascus and killed uh, 13 Iranians, including seven members of Iran's army called IRGC or Iran's Revolutionary Guard. In the last 12 days, there's been a lot of guesswork and speculations by all different sides as how Iran will retaliate, whether Iran will retaliate and if it does, uh, whether it, it would be directly or through its allies in the region. And in the midst of all this like guesswork, a new wave of anti-Iranian propaganda has uh, arisen that is slowly has turned Iran from the victim of a terrorist attack into an aggressor who is attacking Israel and is going to imminently attack Israel and and turn into uh, turn turn the table and turn the victim into the aggressor and so alongside Israel's genocidal war in Gaza and alongside Israel's uh, left and right attack to Iranian sources in Syria and Lebanon, there is a media onslaught against Iran as well. That's how suddenly after years, the the story about the explosion of Jewish Center in Argentina has come up again from the dead and has been revived and come up to the headlines again. So tonight we're going to talk about uh, the latest on this moment of anticipation and the inferno that Iran, Iran has made for for the for the Israeli government by uh, by waiting for Iran's action. But also, we're going to talk about some of the media coverage of the of the story. The guest tonight is Professor Mohammad Marandi, that most of you know, uh, who is a professor at Tehran University, teaches literature and post colonialism, and he's a famous character who doesn't need my introduction, I need his introduction possibly. And me and Professor Marandi have been talking uh, more than 10 times in Jadal Farsi, in my channel in Farsi. And I mean, he was feeling a bit uncomfortable, I'm going to say <laughs> openly for, for us to talk in, in English because we both speak uh, fluent Farsi. But the, the absence of media coverage on Iran, when it comes to Iran, you suddenly have a unanimous unity of all different media work from left to right from liberals to the marxists and the left from <laughs> from uh even those media who have been significant and magnificent in coverage of palestinian plight when it comes to iran uh you cannot trust them much so i asked him uh many times for him to accept that this conversation to be conducted in english and he finally accepted hi mr mandy and welcome to to your own show uh, hi, thank you very much for inviting me. So you've been very much in demand as they think you know you are the man who knows the who knows Iran's next next move. But, but <laughs> I, I want to like unpack a bit of what and of how the media has been depicting the story in the last in the last uh, few days. From one side, they've been saying that Iran should not retaliate. And they've been asking Iran's restrain, and uh, and especially Reuters, New York Times have been at the in the first few days have been asking Iran not to retaliate, let it go, etc. And then inside Iran, they the Western media and the Israeli-owned media and so and from the other other forms of uh, media who are bombarding Iranian minds and hearts, they've been saying that the Iranian military and and the state doesn't have bravado to retaliate. And and so it's very interesting because our two contradictory messages have been produced. So you mean you, you mean the Persian language media that is beamed in from the West into Iran is provoking Iran and saying that Iran is not going to respond and uh, but the English media is saying the opposite, is saying Iran shouldn't attack. Is that is that what you're saying? So exactly. And while while they've been saying, uh, first of all, I mean, they've been th they are threatening Iran in the English media, saying that if Iran does, uh, if Iran 
does retaliate, it will face America and today Britain's very uh, strong reaction. And uh, all like Iran should not do it directly if it does it through what they call its proxies. And we will talk about the fact that Iran has no proxy, has only allies. Uh, it will be more tolerable than Iran's direct reaction from its own soil, etc. Inside Iran, the story is 100, 180 degree opposite. And they're trying to like rub it to Iran's face and humiliate the state for not retaliating or not reta retaliating is strong enough. Yeah? So let's just talk about... Well, that's interesting mm -hmm. because I don't really follow the Persian media that's funded by the West, like this Iran International which everyone knows is uh, rubbish, or BBC, or VOA, or Deutsche Welle, or or the many hundreds of uh, Telegram channels and other and online media. I, I don't I have I don't follow them. So it is interesting that you that you're saying that there are two very distinct narratives. The English language media is, is saying that Iran shouldn't strike back, or Iran should hold back or if it, Iran hits back hard, this there'll be this response. But the Persian media, the way you're putting it, the anti-Iranian Persian media is sort of goading Iran and uh, provoking Iran and telling Iranians that your government's not, uh, doesn't have the uh, courage to stri strike back. I, I find that actually quite remarkable. I, so, didn't, I didn't know that. So let me just kind of start with the front page of Iran International today, the main channel, which started with $250 million of uh, Saudi uh, kind of budget, according to Guardian, in 2017. And the front page says, I translate, Reuters, Iran has ensured America that it will attack, the attack to Israel will be indirect and restrained. Yeah? And that comes from, from, from Reuters, and that becomes frontline front line in Iran. And in, this is like in addition to a lot of like video on the social media about where is your entegamesacht, where is your hard retaliation. And that goes back all the way to January 2020 when after the assassination of General Soleimani, Iran promised to do the hard retaliation and it didn't do it. So, or according to these people, it didn't do it. So they want to Inside Iran, they say Iranian state is not strong enough to, to withstand Israel. So it has to swallow it up and, and move on. And then outside, they're saying Iran is a monster who's brought the whole region into uh, war and destruction. Iran has brought it to destruction, not Israel. Yeah? And so it should watch, otherwise we'll get slapped properly. So let's just start with this one. Will Iran well, it is. I, I think it's that is an, an interesting point. Although I should point out that the report that you read is absolutely incorrect, and that Iran did not send any such message to the United States. And what Reuters says is absolutely wrong. And the, of course, Iran International. Anyone who takes Iran International seriously really uh, can't be taken seriously uh, himself or herself. Um, but yes, the, this discrepancy that you point out, I think, is is something remarkable. And uh, and I actually, I'm I'm sort of thinking that maybe uh, some students should start working on the discrepancy of reporting on Iran in the Western Persian media channels in comparison to Western English media channels, and and then sort of work on and study why the discrepancy is so great. Why the so in this case, why the Persian media channels trying to be provocative so that Iran would strike harder, and then the English media channels are uh, sort of saying Iran is uh, uh, it, what Iran is thinking about doing is very dangerous. That's uh, something that some 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 students should start thinking about seriously. Now I'll, I'll put it to my own students. In any case, yes. But but I think that's that's a good good point to start. It seems like, I mean, at least for me, as someone who's, li who's lived in London for the last 24 years, the image that for all these 24 years was portrayed of Iran was a warmongering war uh, state exporting terrorism to the region and trying to create war here and there. And suddenly in the last 12 days, <laughs> we hear that 
Iran may not, I mean, at least in the last 185 days, they're saying that Iran doesn't want to get involved in the genocide in Gaza, doesn't support Palestinians enough, doesn't do military intervention. And this is funny. I mean, which other countries is doing as much as Iran is doing? So you look at Turkey, and which, in which like even people inside Turkey have very very uh, openly criticized Erdogan and have shown their disgust of his regime's tacit collaboration with Israel by continuing diplomatic relationship and even increasing its economic relationship until very recently, about three days ago. In, compar- in comparison with that, Iran has done uh, its, uh, whatever it could in the last many years. But then all these like, Persian-speaking Western media in the last 185 days have been criticizing Iran for not daring to do much, uh, to do to do more, and and we see the other message inside the Persian scene. So Iran doesn't. Is well, not let me let me okay. respond to this first before I forget. This is something that uh, is not new. It's actually historically when we look at uh, texts written about Iran or Persia or the Orient in general, and, and that which would also include Russia. There's uh, always this, uh, or regularly, a paradox where, since the, the like Iran is presented in a negative light, uh, always, and the, the knowledge of Iran is usually negative, like many other non-Western countries. Um, anything that is negative is sort of accepted, but even though often they're inconsistent with one another, because there is this latent knowledge about. Uh, let's say, the non-Western world or the Iranian in this case. And that latent knowledge is both that it includes, uh, for example, uh, backwardness, incompetence, uh, ignorance. So the Iranian uh, state, of course, it's not a state, it's a regime, it's backward, it's corrupt, it's about to implode. It's a menace uh, to its own people. It's despised. All that is there, and then uh, simultaneously, you hear that it's a it's a rising threat. It's a growing danger. It's a threat to the world. And whereas these two are inconsistent, if something is about to implode, if it's falling apart, if it's incompetent, then how can it be a rising threat to the whole world? So it can't be both at the same time. Yet in these Western narratives, you will see these come simultaneous, you know, they, they come together simultaneously. And people often don't see the inconsistency because both are negative qualities and they both seem right. And then they don't really think deeply about, well, how can both be right at the same time? And that I think is one reason why you see um, all of these inconsistent reporting or uh, articles or academic uh, uh, articles or books about Iran that are full of these inconsistencies, yet they're not uh, uh, critique. There's no real critique about them uh, in the West. They 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 seem to they they're presented as very valid and good. So that is a one major reason why the analysis on Iran is always flawed, almost always flawed. I can't say always, but almost always flawed because it is based upon this latent knowledge that goes back hundreds of years ago, knowledge that comes from newspapers in the past, that come from literature, that come from uh, culture, popular culture, movies, and uh, even in the past middle age uh, texts and before that, this this is this has accumulated over the centuries, and there's been a consistency, a sort of uh, in this otherization. So it, it is uh, it is very much a part of what we see today as well. Whether it's in the Western media, whether it's in Western cinema, whether it's in Western intellectual uh, uh, endeavors or textbooks or articles, it is it is it is regularly. Something it is something that we see very regularly. It's, it's all fine. I mean, I, I absolutely <laughs> agree because there is a foundation, there is a there is a background, and there is like as we call it philosophically, there are like uh, conditional possibility of this form of uh, pseudo knowledge to become uh, accepted by people. I mean, when you 
present an image of this demonic uh, state or regime, as they call it. Yeah. So there should be something in us which makes us prone to accept it. However, it's like there's a question of basic intelligence as well. I, I would like to like show one clip here, which came right after Israel's illegal and criminal terrorist attack on a consulate, on, a, on the soil of another country. So you can be against Iranian state, you can be, you can, you can even be pro-Israel, but attacking another country's soil, another country's embassy is like, is a warmongering thing, is like breaking any form of like international law. And, and especially for the West, who has to be the the, the, the the guardians of the liberal international law that they created and they are they, they put there you don't see enough anger or you, you didn't we didn't hear enough accusation of it the same way that we didn't hear enough accusation of assassination of the general of the top army man of another country which is equivalent of attacking well, another country let me let me uh point point something out here which I think is important and that is that what the Israeli regime did is that it violated international law at three levels. One is that it violated Syrian airspace when it sent its F-35s into Syria. And uh, I think they fired, the F-35s fired six rockets or, or missiles into the building. So one is that they violated Syrian airspace, which they do regularly, and which is never discussed in the Western media because Western the Western media is 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 Eurocentric, Western journalists, Western uh, media outlets. They're 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 exceptionalists. They consider themselves to be superior. So for them, it's natural that Israel can go into Syria and bomb Syria whenever it wants because it's Israel. If the United States the United States is illegally occupying one third of Syria as we speak, it's stealing Syrian oil. It's taking Syrian oil and using it and also exporting it. The U.S. military like pirates, but no one in the West uh, complains about it because the United States, if they do it, it is it is somehow legitimate. Uh, so in uh, uh, so here, the Israeli regime violated Syrian airspace. At the second level, they bombed an, the Iranian embassy. So they destroyed uh, the embassy. The, the consulate is a part of the embassy complex. I've been there many times. Uh, it is on a main street. It is very clear. Uh, anyone, everyone in Damascus knows the building because it is. It has. It's. It's a. It's a nice, very nice looking building. It has a. Um, uh, the architecture uh, on the outside is is very traditional and Iranian. So uh, it has destroyed uh, that building, and uh, which. Uh, Again, in the so-called rule-based international order, which is biased towards the West because they created it after the Second World War, uh, they are. Uh, this is this is undermining the foundations of the rules-based order, the the Western-oriented rules-based order. But still, uh, the Israelis carried out that out, and then, of course, they murdered. Uh, Iranian and uh, Syrian nationals. So uh, that's and that's the third. So um, this is something that you would expect any country in the world to uh, condemn. Uh, but in the UN Security Council, the United States refused to condemn this. The uh, the British uh, government refused to condemn this. And the French government and the UN Security Council refuse to condemn this. So for them, it is okay for the Israeli regime to bomb, to violate Syrian airspace, to bomb the Iranian embassy, and to murder Iranians. It's fine with them. Yet, when the Iranians say that we're going to retaliate, we see that their leaders and their politicians and the Western media uh, express deep concern that Iran is escalating, whereas it, the Israeli regime basically attacked Iran's Iran sovereignty. So it's, but I think by now people understand this because the mainstream Western media, Western politicians have been supporting the genocide in Gaza for six months. They no longer have any credibility. And we're seeing this 
we, even within Western countries and in the United States, we, we're seeing how public figures in the United States are increasingly turning against uh, the regime's support for this uh, brutal genocide in Gaza. So um, in, in the Western media is trying to depict Iran as, as somehow the aggressor here, even though Iran is the victim. And they they rumor they they try to spread rumors. What sort of meeting was in the building? You know, just sheer speculation. I'm, actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to I'm gonna go to that. Actually, let's just do let's just watch this video together because I think it has so much to say about the form of media warfare, the form of cognitive dissonance that they are creating about Iran, and and we can talk about many of these questions in light of this video. Now, the difficulty is, I mean, I, okay, let me just put this video and we start watching this video is for, by, as you Masi know. Masi Alinejad, uh, an Iranian okay. journalist and activist. Uh, Masi, thanks so much for being here. What are you hearing about how the people of Iran, how they feel about this attack? To be honest, Iranians are celebrating the killings of uh, seven uh, IRGC commanders in Damascus, in Syria. But, Jake, let me just ask this question um, to Iranian regime, because they're hearing me. I really want to know, not just me, millions of Iranians, they really want to know that, how, what, I mean, what these seven high-ranking members of Revolutionary Guards were doing in Syria. Of course they were planning for another October 7. Of course they were coordinating another attacks on uh, civilians. And that's why I believe that was a self-defense. And millions of Iranians, based on the videos that I received, celebrate the killings of the members of IRGC because these are the officials that they because wrote. These are... Okay, I'll stop it here. So, Masi Alinejad, one of the... I mean, people know her. She's big. She was a very, like, I don't know... Uh, I mean, she was a very normal, ordinary journalist almost losing his job in 2015 and by miraculous thing became suddenly this voice of Iran and she's like Iran as as she said last year in Woman Life Freedom. Well, she, I mean she, she's not uh, completely sane and she's not the voice of Iran no, she, she for the western media for the lib especially the liberal western media they've made her into some kind of uh voice of Iran and I I find that to to be uh actually uh, an extension of what I was saying earlier that um, uh, through the, that Orientalist uh, worldview that they've have towards Iran and towards much of the global South and uh, the the other the non-Western world, they uh, are constantly miscalculating. They constantly misunderstand. Even though they may travel to these countries, they may look. Some of them may learn the language. Let's say Persian, come to Iran, but they still never really understand it because the foundation of their knowledge is that latent knowledge, that latent Orientalism, which I described earlier. And then when they choose people, and it's not just her. There, there. It's an industry. There are thousands of Iranians who are involved in this anti-Iranian industry in the West. They they pay these people. They promote these people, both in the their Persian media channels and in their and of course in the international Western media channels. And but the problem is that while they promote these people for their anti-Iranian propaganda purposes. The problem that they have is that they start believing these people. So they they put these people uh, on media, they, put, they fund them, they support them, they empower them, but they do it in order to undermine Iran or to discredit Iran, which is fine. That's, they're waging, they're waging uh, a media campaign against the country. It's a, it's a media, it's media warfare. But if, if, but the stupidity, the foolishness, is when they actually believe their own propagandists. And that is, I think, what undermines the West when it comes to Iran. And not only Iran, I'm, I'm, I, w without really being uh, too uh, an expert, I, could, I, I would imagine the same is true in, when it comes to all of their uh, so-called adversaries, because they believe their own propaganda, and then uh, they calculate and they uh, they plan, they carry out planning, they formulate policies based on that propaganda or exactly. that 
uh, mm-hmm. those people, what those people say, and then they don't, they always fail, and they wonder why, no matter what they do, their policies never achieve the desired results. And it's for this very, the, the, it's because they promote such uh, not very intelligent people. No, but that's interesting. But but or but, very sane. But but the curiosity that I have here is. I think the liberal media, when you when we all have this agreement with liberal media, but this is doing they're doing something even in contradiction of their own values. Look at them. I mean, Alinejad is not a liberal character. She is the one who met up with Pompeo. She was in uh, the ca- she was in the camp of Pompeo, John Bolton, and uh, like the the right wing of the like, Trump government. So, and she is like, she's the one who attacks Ilhan Omar left and right. She is with the far right of both the United States and far right of Europe. She's with the Islamophobic, almost like fascistic, racist elements that Democrats and someone like CNN should actually be against them. But when it comes to Iran... She's, she, I mean, I, I understand where you're coming from, but she's not important. I don't think, you know, you should concern be too concerned about her there are many no. like her it, in fact during the 1980s and the 1990s many of the and and afterwards and more recently many of the people who the united states and uh western media were uh using as spokespeople of the iranian people were the mek so people from the uh terrorist organ the mujahideen al terrorist organization when the, in the 1980s they carried out between 11 to 17000 uh assassinations uh and bomb attacks and uh, well, at least 11 I, I don't, i'm not quite sure about the number but some numbers go up to 17000 uh, 17, meaning 17000 iranians were murdered by these terrorists and then they went to iraq and fought as soldiers for saddam hussein and then when Saddam fell, they became foot soldiers for the Americans. And now they, many of them are based in Albania and they're a part of, they, they have sci, uh, they have a huge cyber army there where day and night they're on Facebook and Twitter and uh, Instagram and elsewhere constantly attacking Iran day and night. Each of them have tens of different uh, accounts. So these people who are mercenaries or terrorists, they have been often promoted under different names. They have all these front organizations with different names. And then these terrorists who fought, you know, who helped, who murdered people in Iran and then fought for Saddam Hussein and then acted as mercenaries for the United States and cooperated with the Israeli regime in carrying out assassinations inside Iran. These people are presented as the spokespeople of the Iranians. And then the West wonders why uh, their analysis uh, or their uh, policies with regards to Iran failed because they don't understand Iran. No, that's, that's Again, not... they they believe their own propaganda. I don't, I, I, that's right. But but we are dealing with a different law. We are dealing with, we're dealing with a different level of... Uh, propaganda here when it comes to iran there's no principle that's that's my point is tonight let's just come watch watch the rest of it so in a sense cnn in general would not let a far-right trumpist and who is like openly islamophobic on uh, cnn wouldn't give them platform but when it comes to iran there is no distinguishing and let's just watch the rest of it sorrow and sadness and misery to the people of Iran, not just to the people of Iran, in the region as well. I received a video, people were like uh, drinking and cheering for the killings of these uh, warmongers. And I said to myself that people of Iran never, never, uh, you know, want war, but they are happy when they see that those who created war, those who started war now uh, you know, uh, getting killed in the chaos that they are the main creator of the chaos. And- no, let me just want to make it clear. This is not about this person. I mean, in a sense, she's like one of the many puppets that uh, have come up in the machinery of Western propaganda. My problem is actually this is amazing video to disclose CNN. They are showing that video in the left side of the image and there are fa- four hands, four hands moving four glasses and that's supposed to be the celebration of 85 million Iranians 
for the assassination of seven commanders of IRGC. So based on that video, I think back in 2002, 2003, when... Well, put, if you have the clip of the funeral, uh, and then you could just put it, uh, show it, and then you it's it becomes clear how uh, desperate CNN is in its propaganda. And that's that, I think, is the extraordinary thing. I have no doubt that CNN monitored the funeral. And in the funeral, hundreds of thousands of people in Tehran participated, if not more, if not in the millions. It was massive. And the, you know, uh, they took footage with helicopters. So I'm sure the C CNN has that footage. But when they choose to use I don't know, a picture of four people drinking. But which four where, people? I, it can be, it can be even, oh, No one even knows who they are, where they are. But that's irrelevant. The point is that CNN, it knows that it's promoting propaganda. But the problem is that many of these Western analysts, they actually watch CNN. Ordinary people don't because mainstream Western media is collapsing. The BBC is collapsing. All of these are collapsing, West American, British, European, and alternative media is growing. And I'm sure that the West is going to clamp down on these increasingly, uh, and they are already doing so. But in any case, uh, many of these analysts watch these uh, programs. And so their analysis uh, on Iran is founded upon, again, as I said earlier, their own propaganda. And this is, by the way, true in Iran. I've met many Western ambassadors or Western diplomats in Tehran. And their understanding, over the years, not recently, and their understanding in Iran, these European uh, ambassadors and diplomats, uh, almost universally, I, I can't say every single one, but almost all of them over the years that I've been interacting with. Their understanding of Iran is founded upon their interaction with like-minded Iranians, people who frequent the embassy, they go to embassy parties, they they want to get visas, they want to, they're business people, they go back and forth, they don't want to say anything that runs against, they're not going to say things to them that Westerners don't like, to, these Western diplomats don't like to hear. So they surround themselves with people like, you know, who drink with them and who party with them and who think alike with them. And even if they don't think alike, they will not say it to them directly. And there's this, they create this echo chamber. And then these embassies, uh, these ambassadors and officials, they have these gatherings together and they're all, of course, on the same page and their analysis is uh, similar. And so obviously they're based in Iran and they all are saying the same thing. Same thing. So that's what the truth must be. But in reality, uh, they are getting, they get it wrong. They've been getting it wrong for years. And it's based upon, again, that, uh, that um, Orientalist, uh, Eurocentric, exceptionalist worldview, but also uh, the very fact that they are engaging in, uh, they often engage in media warfare against Iran. It's a part of their broader, uh, you know, uh, or the, the broader war, economic warfare that they're engaging in Iran, sometimes military warfare, as they did in the 1980s, or against the Palestinians, against the people of Yemen, against you know the people of Iraq and Syria and elsewhere through dirty wars and so on. It is a part of that broader campaign for to maintain Western dominance, dominance, which is collapsing. But then the problem is that when they, as I said earlier, they true, engage true. in this media time, warfare, the but then they believe mm -hmm. their own propaganda. So they, so their ambassadors are in, an, and their embassy staff are in an echo chamber, mm -hmm. and then their media is saying the same thing. So there, there's this enormous narrative that uh, that's uh, that's that runs like a river. And if you don't say, if you don't if you don't abide by that powerful narrative, then you are you're you're crazy. You're an extremist. You're a mouthpiece. But, but at the same time, and, and I mean, so you on. have you have like I don't know, especially now with the with the rise of social media, you have like great media works like Gray Zone and uh, and the like who are trying to like disclose and decode all these like propaganda pla uh, patterns and and logics. But when it comes to Iran, I mean, as I said, I mean, no one does it. This little video is just for me is the epitome and the Kind of example par excellence of 
something which would like reveal CNN, how, how cheap its propaganda has become. And yet, despite like five or six days having passed, no one has pointed to how bad, how bad it is. I'm going to show like the actual, demo, the actual demonstration and, and the march in Tehran last Friday after that. But before that, just give me five more seconds of the presenter's reaction to this storm of nonsense and, and lies by, by Ali Najad, and then we move to, uh, we move to actual demonstration sorrow and sadness and misery to the people of Iran, not just to the people of Iran, Iran, not just to the people of... Because the Quds Force, I mean, beyond trying to get Hezbollah and Hamas and, and other proxies to attack Israel and attack the United States, uh, they oppress the Iranian people. I mean, the Iranian people in general, you say, consider them uh, to be their enemy. Terrorist. Yeah. Terrorist. Look, um, there was mass... This is the presenter. I mean, instead of saying that, where did you make that film? Did you make it in your own basement? Well, what, what, he, what? He, is, he is a supporter of the genocide. He is very close to the Israeli regime. So, you know, it's not as if CNN is a media outlet. They, uh, I, I think by now, everything has been exposed. I think that what has happened over the last six months has done more to expose the West than anything we've seen over the last few decades. Not that they haven't, the, the United States and its allies haven't done uh, equally ter terrible things to uh, other countries uh, and other peoples, uh, you know, besides the Gazans and the Palestinians. No, they've been doing it for centuries. Uh, the, the plunder of Africa, uh, the the destruction of the native civilizations in Latin America, uh, the, the subjugation of the Indian subcontinent. And yes, this is the funeral of the uh, two generals and the uh, five uh, officers, uh, which he says that uh, people in Iran were celebrating. So, and you know, this is just one of the streets because there are many uh, side streets and uh, parallel streets where the, the the demonstration and the funeral procession was taking place. So it, it again, it's just it just goes to show that these Western media outlets are propaganda uh, machines. They they have no credibility. They are still trying to milk uh, fake stories. They're still repeating fake stories from September to October, uh, the 7th of October last year, to justify the daily massacres of women and children in Gaza. They're still promoting fake stories of rape and fake stories of beheaded children in order to justify the Israeli regime's daily murders. These are the sort of people that if they were around in Germany in the 1930s and the 1940s, they would be justifying the Nazi regime. They are, these are, are horrible. They are, they are the, the most evil sort of people that we can find on this planet. But again, as I said, this is it's not as if they haven't been doing this before, but what is fascinating, oh, well, it's painful, but it's what is fascinating about the last six months is that this is the first genocide that has been carried out live in front of a global audience. We literally see the atrocities take place as they take place or a few minutes afterwards. And then as this, the genocide is taking place or as this Holocaust has been taking place as the Brazilian uh, president alluded to, he, he said this is like the, 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 and many others said it's like the Nazi Holocaust of, of World War II. As this genocide is taking place, Western leaders are supporting the Israeli regime. Western media is uniformly supporting the Israeli regime. And uh, they continue to send weapons, the German regime, the British regime, uh, the, everyone uh, across the board. They they support the 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 what what is going on. They they help uh, and then they try to deny the genocide taking place, even though this uh, apartheid genocidal regime uh, is blocking food. Openly saying they call the Palestinians Amalek, which you know a biblical reference, basically saying they should all be wiped out. In the, just like in the in the. Uh, as the biblical story goes, they they uh, they prevent food from going in, medicine from going in, and then the West, after 
the International Court of Justice said that uh, may, uh, it, it gave it um, its its it gave its um, its judgment went against the Israeli regime. Immediately, the West uh, they cut off aid to the UN agency, which was funding and helping and giving food to the people of Gaza in order to help the Israeli regime carry out the starvation. So the West collectively is carrying out starvation, and people like this this uh, host, among other hosts. They are part of that apparatus. They are a part of this. They are, they are, they are, he's a foot soldier working in the media and he is assisting the genocide. He is helping the regime carry out the genocide. He's a propagandist of the of the worst kind. And what has happened in the last six months is that this has been exposed to the world. People across the world see it now. So that, that's that's in, comes, okay, that, that comes exactly my question. I know, I mean, I would love to listen to you. The whole day, but I know that you have an in, important interview after this with actual like <laughs> media, not a small one like me. But yes. uh, but but let me just go to this one because what Iran is going to do is a big question for everyone. So this is like uh, New York Times and Avrego saying that Middle East crisis, travel warnings issued as Israel prepares for possible Iranian strike, and this image of Tel Aviv in a gloomy way, as if like the Iranians are making like, I don't know, they're like bringing darkness to this city of love and, <laughs> and, and sunshine. So the first thing is, it's been like 12 days. Many people say, where is Iran's strike? Why Iran hasn't retaliated? Then there's like a speculation. They brought some Israeli army general yesterday to uh, kind of a, Channel 12 of Israel saying that Iranians want a revenge call. The other one says Iran is not doing. Then again, Reuters said Iranians have told America we're not going to do. Yesterday, Iranian ambassador to United Nations said if only United Nations Security Council had condemned the attack, we didn't have to retaliate. So there are lots no, of mixed messages. That's not what he said. But that's how he was that's, reported. So what did yes, he say? That's to how it was reported. Yeah. What did he but say? But it also said if the I don't remember the wording, but it also, and if those who, the culprits were punished, and not just condemned, but also if those who, you know, carried out this attack were punished. But they, in the reporting that I saw, uh, they removed this uh, this part of the statement. So, so to start, why do you think Iran has not retaliated yet? And the other question is, do you think, in your understanding, Iran will retaliate? Because both said Hassan Nasrullah, who is famous to be the uh, the truth saying uh, leader he has never ever in his uh, I mean all the facts that he's presented he's they always been delivered he's not known to be yes, he's known to be he's very famous yeah. as for being very honest even That's the Israelis right. say that he's exactly, yeah. you know, they acknowledge and, that and he came and said Iranians will do it they will do it themselves not their allies them yeah, and they will do it from their own uh, territory so when is it going to happen? So why all this waiting and what's the purpose of this waiting, Make, making Israeli wait? Well, first of all, I think that Western regimes should thank Iran uh, in the sense that for, ye for years the Iranians have shown strategic patience. Uh, this is not the first time that the Israeli regime has murdered Iranians. And uh, it's, it's very interesting that in the West they you know, constantly attribute terrorism to Iran. But we see the Israeli regime carry out assassinations in Iran. We see the MEK carry out assassinations in Iran. We see uh, terrorist organizations based in northern Iraq, funded by the West, carry out attacks inside Iran. We see ISIS, which is where their affiliations to the West uh, are, are known to everyone. Uh, carry out attacks in Iran. We see terrorist organizations from Pakistan carry out attacks in Iran. So all these different, and just, just three, four days ago, there was an attack from inside Pakistan by Western backed, uh, a Western backed terror group killing uh, five Iran Iranian uh, police officers. Just a couple. So why are all the terrorist attacks being carried out against Iranians? Yet Iran is the terrorist organization. Of course, recently we had Chinese nationals murdered in Pakistan. Then we had the uh, attack in Russia where 140, 50, 40 some people were 
murdered. Why are all the, or in Syria, where the West carried out the dirty war, we know that on February the 12th, 2012, Jake Sullivan, the current U.S. National Security Advisor, wrote an email to Hillary Clinton, who was the Secretary of State at that time, saying Al-Qaeda is on our side in Syria. Or on, on the same year, you had the um, uh, U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency document, which said that between Iraq and Syria, U.S. regional allies want to create a Salafist entity, which was ISIS. And then later on, the head of that agency at that time, General Michael Flynn, said U.S. policy under Obama was to help create that Salafist entity. In other words, they were supporting ISIS. And then we saw the leaked, uh, aud we read, heard the leaked audio of uh, John uh, of Kerry, the Secretary of State at that time, who said that the U.S. allowed ISIS to advance on Damascus. So we know the relationship of these terror groups with the West, but the Western media, like the CNN, like CNN and other outlets, are constantly saying Iran supports terror and so on. But it's strange that Iran, which supports terror, is constantly the victim of terrorism, where you don't see anything happening anywhere in Europe or Canada or the United States. So I find that I find that. Uh, very interesting. But in any case, the West should be very grateful to Iran that it has shown such strategic patience over the years where the Israelis carried out assassinations or the Israelis violated Syrian sovereignty and they would kill Iranians. Why were they killing Iranians in Syria? Because the Iranians were preventing ISIS and Al-Qaeda, which the Israelis and NATO countries and oil-rich dictatorships in the region, uh, they were preventing ISIS and Al-Qaeda and their affiliates from uh, capturing Damascus. So the Iranians were fighting against ISIS. And whenever, for example, mm -hmm. near the border with uh, Israel, uh, whenever the Syrian army or the Iranians would, when their allies or Hezbollah would advance to defeat ISIS and Al-Qaeda, uh, the Israeli regime would carry out airstrikes or they would use artillery or tank fire to support ISIS and Al-Qaeda, which both had bases alongside the Golan Heights. They would also treat the injured uh, terrorists, and they would also give them weapons and ammunition to fight against Iran. So back then, Iran was, did not retaliate because its focus was on helping to stabilize Syria. They didn't want to spread the, this conflict, but the Israelis were helping these terrorist groups. And then more recently, during the last six months, the Israelis continued to kill a number of Iranians in Syria, but the Iranians wanted the focus to stay on Gaza. They did not want the narrative to shift away from that. So Iran, showed again, showed strategic patience. But here, since they actually attacked they they uh, they attacked Iranian sovereignty. The Iranians said, "Well, this is you know they have to respond because if Iran doesn't respond, then the Israeli regime will say, well, we, I can do whatever I like and nothing's going to happen." So Iran will definitely respond, and I think that Iran's response will be an adequate response. And uh, so, so, if so, the Israeli so, regime so, is foolish, okay. if the Israeli regime is foolish and strikes back at, at Iran, Iran will hit them again and it hit them very hard. In this exchange, have no doubt that the Israeli regime will be on the losing end. So the smart thing for the Israelis would be not to respond, because they would be actually falling into Iran's, uh, it would be to Iran's advantage. Because in the, uh, at, by striking the embassy, the world has is on Iran's side. Who no one really cares about the Americans and the Europeans. The Americans and the Europeans are the ones who are behind the genocide. The world knows who they are now. The international community, meaning the global South, uh, minus these uh, uh, these rogue regimes, uh, they know where why Iran is going to respond. So Israel is going to have to accept punishment. But if they want to continue, the advantage is with Iran, because Iran has a much more powerful missile uh, capability and a much more powerful drone capability. And the Israeli regime is already losing in Gaza and on the border with Lebanon. OK, let me just kind of ask. This is a good point. And let me just ask the first question. I've been talking to a lot of like peace activists in Washington, those like people who are like being on the front line of the struggle against uh, of Israeli propaganda. and. And they, there was a bit of sense of worry that because they believe that what, there's no rift between Washington and Tel Aviv, despite what we see in media. I'm not, I, I, I don't agree with them. I think the rift is real between Washington and, and Tel Aviv. But uh, nonetheless, they thought if Iran retaliates, it will distract 
and shift away the narrative from the fact that Israel is doing genocide, the Palestinian has, has entered killing the 34,000 uh, number of people to war between Iran and Israel. And especially as we know, as uh, today, the, the headline was, Iran... <laughs> Uh, will Iran attack Israel? So there was no remembering, there was no memory of the fact that if Iran, even if Iran, Iran does attack, is retaliate, is different. So people who have very little memory these days in the time of like social media, if they just read the news today without having read the news, if they come back from holiday, they think, oh my God, these mullahs are going to attack Israel once again, yeah, for no reason, poor Israel. So, And they were worried that that will shift away the narrative, that will give excuse to Washington to go and support Netanyahu, who is almost falling apart more. And so that would be doing a service to to Israel and to the warmongers in Washington. What's your answer to that? Well, a, a, a couple of things. And something that I, you said earlier that I also just remember that I wanted to uh, uh, raise, and that is that actually uh, in, there are people in the West who have, uh, have been... Uh, very uh, different than others when it comes to Iran. They're they're a small group, but uh, but many of the people who have been highly critical of the Israeli regime and Western policy towards the Israelis from uh, years back, and many of them, those who I've done interviews with on their uh, uh, YouTube channels or on uh, their Rumble channels and and all that. Um, they, uh, they they have done a very good job in trying to create awareness about Iran, and I'd like to thank them for that. Uh, when it comes to um, Iran and the Israeli regime, no, I, I I I really wouldn't take the West and Western media that seriously anymore. I think across the world, the real international community, the global majority, knows what the Israeli regime did to Iran, and they recognize that this is unacceptable, and they know that any response that Iran gives is uh, is legitimate and it's it's right if if this was an if if it was an american embassy if it was a Euro, if it was a french or british embassy have no doubt that they would uh, seek retaliatory measures they would bomb that country they would impose sanctions they would uh, get the un security council to condemn them there's no doubt about that they would go far further they may even try to overthrow the government that carried out the attack, whether it was intentional or, or otherwise. So the, the, the international community is not going to be fooled by the BBC or CNN or the New York Times or The Guardian or Fox News or anything like that. They they recognize uh, so, so let that Iran take has to, this to the legitimate right. today by David Cameron, which says, today I made clear... The language is unbelievable. So <laughs> this dictating and it's like so uh, authoritarian... Uh, today I made clear to Foreign Minister Amir Abdullahian that Iran must not draw the Middle East into a wider conflict. My God, Iran has already done enough in creating a conflict in the Middle East. Should they stop doing these bad things again and this like genocidal act? I'm deeply concerned about the potential for miscalculation leading to further violence. And Cameron never ever said that when Israel against any form of international law attacked Iran's consulate only 11 days ago. And then he continues, Iran should instead work to de-escalate and prevent further attacks. How do yes, you but, yes, but Cameron and other Western leaders who make such statements are simply discrediting themselves because people, people are much more politically aware today than they ever were before in my lifetime. Without a doubt, in... We have never, I, I've never seen a situation like this where even in the West, people uh, are turning, uh, you know, overwhelmingly, and young people, Jews, Christians, Muslims, others, Hindus are turning uh, against the policies of, of these regimes and they see what they're doing. And by the way, the number of deaths in Gaza are not 33, 34,000. They are much higher because. There, if I'm not mistaken, there's something there's something like 13,000 people who are missing. Most of them are dead under the rubble, and then there are thousands of people who are died of sickness, of malnutrition, infants, and they're never going to be a part of the statistics. 
So the, the numbers are probably well over 50,000. And now that the West, now that the EU and Canada and the UK and the US and Australia alongside Israel have succeeded in imposing starvation, especially on northern Gaza, we're going to see a, a huge rise in the number of people who die of starvation. And it is people like Cameron who has starved the people of Gaza. So people see through that propaganda. I, I, th maybe uh, I would have, I would agree that three, four years ago, if he had said this, it would have had a, a much bigger impact. Even though back then he was just him and people like him were just as hypocritical. But uh, people see through them. They, everyone knows that the Israeli, no, this is, you know, what the Israelis did to the Iranian embassy is outrageous, and that he did not condemn it, and he prevented the UN Security Council from condemning it, and now he's. Uh, threat, you know, he's he's acute, he's pointing fingers, his finger at Iran. Everyone recognizes the hypocrisy in all of this, and this comes within the broader hypocrisy of uh, uh, of the uh, you know the, where where we see a genocide taking place in Gaza, Holocaust taking place in Gaza, and and the West, which pretended to care about women and human rights and human values. They have been a partner to this genocide along with the Israelis, and they've been with the Israelis every step of the way. It's, it's, it's excellent. So, I mean, one important point that you said in between, I think you were saying that Iran didn't want to usurp the, the, the scene from the actual resistance. And, and we saw that. I mean, in a sense, I think Amir Abdullahian was much more active in the first couple of weeks of the of the thing, and I think I, I, I was critical of him myself, saying that why he's not doing more, why he's left the stage to opportunistic, uh, uh, hypocritic uh, politicians such as Erdogan, who are coming and talking on behalf of Palestinian cause. But I think Iran did the right thing by staying silent, by allowing the resistance doing its own job. And I think when I say resistance, I don't only mean military resistance, I mean the real resistance of actual ordinary people in Palestine who, despite hunger, famine, destruction, white phosphorus bomb, have a state there. I think when I see these images of ordinary Palestinians there, I think, oh my God, each one of them is like a commander of a of a court's army because just staying there and not trying to escape because that was the main <laughs> that was the main aim of Israel to do to push them in order to do its ethnic cleansing. I mean, as many people have said it rightly, uh, the main aim was not to destroy Hamas or anything. To the, to main, the main aim, aim was to to push the Palestinians out and their state. So, and I think they are the protagonists of this narrative. And Iran didn't want to be part of this narrative. Iran didn't want to steal the show, steal the limelight from, from them. And I think that was that was the right thing. Yeah? So that's one point that you, you mentioned well. But the other thing which is interesting you say, I want to like get more of it, you say you don't care about what the West says about Iran. So, uh, And you are more interested about the global South response to Iran's retaliation and its just uh, defense of its uh, capabilities and also to repair its deterrence because many people have pointed out that at this stage, if Iran doesn't retaliate, its deterrence have been uh, compromised. Yeah. So, so in a sense, we're right. So I want to like take you to two of these countries. So today, Qatar and Kuwait inform US that they cannot use their base on their territories against Iran. So we are hearing interesting, different kind of voice uh, from different countries. So two countries who until very recent, I mean, I think Qatar is still is an important ally to United States. U.S. has an important military base there. It's saying openly that no attack from us to Iran. Is this out of change of politics, out of courtesy, or out of fear of Iran's retaliation? Because I remember a couple of years ago, Iran said very openly that we will attack U.S. and any country which had which which U.S. attacks have happened from them. Well, first, I'd like to point out that you're, you're absolutely correct about the heroic resistance of the uh, people of Gaza and, and the fact that they refuse to leave their land. And many who live in the north refuse to leave the north despite the starvation and the massacres uh, and the fact that Western media has always tried to justify 
the massacres and hide the massacres. Or just recently, the Al Shifa Hospital, the Israelis massacred physicians and hospital staff, and the Western media hid this from the public. But again, it's not, you know, people are seeing this on social media. And when I say the global south, I mean the states, but even in the West too, uh, young people, as I said earlier, and many people from all walks of life are turning against the Western narrative. People are waking up. And I, I consider all these people to be a part of the resistance. Uh, many of these people are, are, are actually very heroic because they're paying a price, young Jews, young uh, Christians and Muslims and Hindus and others in in Western countries standing up, to, uh, you know, they, it's it's not easy for them uh, to do this. So, but uh, but that aside, yes, I Iran. Uh, I think when Iran responds, the international community will recognize Iran's position. It won't distract attention away from the narrative uh, of Gaza because Iran's response will be painful. It will teach the Israeli regime a lesson. But at the same time, uh, there are two things here that have to be taken into account. One is that you cannot distract the world away from tens of thousands of people who have been massacred and slaughtered by this barbaric and inhumane and illegitimate regime, this ethno-supremacist regime. No one can hide that anymore. And second of all, if there is escalation, and this is, I'm getting close to responding to your second point, if there is escalation, then uh, again, it will be the Israeli regime that's to blame, because they're the ones who started this by, pro by bombing the Iranian embassy. And the West is to blame for allowing the Israeli regime to get away with it, like the genocide. And of course, when they let the Israelis carry out genocide, obviously bombing embassies would be okay too for the for the West. But Iran has to uh, punish the Israelis, otherwise they'll repeat this. Tomorrow they'll bomb the embassy in, in Beirut. The, after that, they'll bomb the embassy in Baghdad. Then after, they they won't stop because it is a rogue and an evil regime. But the reason why countries in the region don't want them or don't want the Americans to use their bases is that they know quite well that if the United States does strike Iran, those countries that host American bases, they cannot pretend that they're innocent. That won't happen. That Iran won't accept that. And all of their assets are right in front of Iran. All of the oil and gas installations are easily accessible to Iran. They can easily be destroyed by Iran within hours. And that would, and of course, the US assets in Iraq and Syria will be gone. It will create a global economic catastrophe that will destroy the, the global, it will destroy the global economy and it will destroy the Western economies. So the United States isn't foolish enough not to know that. And if that happens, countries like Russia, they'll be ex exporting oil. It, they will be the losers. The West will be the losers. So there is a sort of balance of terror here. They will be blamed. They will suffer the consequences. And uh, therefore, I think that that is a huge incentive to dissuade the United States from escalating. And that's why the United States has never attacked Iran directly over the past, past few decades. For president after president, they came to power and said all options are on the table, but they never actually attacked Iran because they recognize that Iran is powerful and Iran is much more powerful today than it was before. Look, the Americans have lost in the Red Sea in battling uh, Ansarullah. We, we all knew from the beginning they'd fail, but now they've discovered that they cannot defeat Ansarullah. Israel cannot defeat Hamas and its allies, Islamic Jihad and others. And obviously they can never defeat Hezbollah. The United States knows that it's vulnerable in Iraq and Syria, and it knows that its position in the Persian Gulf uh, would be undermined if there is major conflict. The Iran and its allies and its friends across the region are much more powerful today than they were before. And the world is changing. The West has grown weak. The balance of power has shifted. So the smart thing for the Americans and the Europeans to do 
is to tell the Israeli regime to take its punishment and accept it and uh, to push the regime to end the genocide because the, 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 the side that needs a ceasefire more than anyone else is the Israeli regime. So, so, the, so you're, the, not, you're, the, you're not worried the, about... The, the genocide mm -hmm. aside, ju just this final point, the genocide aside, we all want an immediate ce ceasefire for the sake of the people that the West and Israel are destroying. Uh, the, the, the starvation that they're imposing upon these people and the, the murder, the bombings with Western weaponry, all of this is outrageous and unacceptable and we want it to end now. But the side that has lost the war is the Israeli regime. And every day that goes by, the world hates this regime even more. And the world comes to hate Western regimes even more because they see them as a part of this genocide. So who, the longer this world, this war lasts, the worse it is for the Israeli regime and its Western partners in genocide. So they need a ceasefire more than anything else. And, the, and if they try to uh, expand the war, in order to escape this defeat, they're only going to make it worse for themselves. So the smart thing for to do is for the West to tell the Israelis it's right, but to but at the same take time their know, punishment, uh, but right. also to end the war. But at the same time, we know that Netanyahu is... And the genocide. At the same time, we know that Netanyahu is desperate. Yeah. So in a sense, he wants to, he's like, as we say in Farsi, the, the person who is like it, drawn is like sticking to any form of grass moving. Yeah. So al qarika tashabbas bikula hashish. You know, so he's like using any opportunity to <laughs> elongate the genocidal war and trying to bring Americans into the conflict, etc. So, I mean, just let me just come take you to the headlines since this morning and how they're trying to change the narrative. So exclusive is Wall Street Journal. U.S. moves warships to defend Israel in case of Iranian attack. So very like, like it's a very it's almost like comical how the attack and defend is like using is like propaganda 101 yeah how to turn the victim into yes the but look when 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 the americans when ansar allah in yemen started blocking blockading israeli ports right because they the ansar allah said that they have to stop the genocide and ansar allah and the yemeni armed forces and the yemeni government said that we are implementing uh, the genocide convention. What did the Americans do instead of forcing the Israeli regime to end the genocide? They started attacking Yemen. Did they succeed? So the Americans brought in their ships and they said, yes, we'll do And the CNN and all these other Western media outlets said, yes, they're coming in. They're going to, you know, punish them. And what happened? They failed. After months, Ansar Allah is stronger today than it was three months ago, and the U.S. has, has been humiliated. So do you think these warships are going to be able to do anything against Iran when they failed against Yemen? Of course not. That's just Western propaganda. That's, you know, that bravado is, you know, it's, mm. it's that, that era is gone. They're losing the war. And by the way, simultaneously, there's a war going on in Europe, in Ukraine, which they are losing. So, so the West has, and then they have China, they have more than enough trouble as it is. What they can do is they can, and, and of course, even though the Israeli people are, uh, you know, 80% of the Israelis want uh, the regime to, con to continue and expand the genocide. They want to go into Rafah because the, 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 the Israeli people are a brainwashed racist uh, people. And when 80% want to expand the genocide, it shows how, how sick that society is. But what the Americans can do is they can find partners inside Israel and ultimately try to bring about a political coup against Netanyahu and then bring in one of these other genocidal politicians and then okay. have some sort of ceasefire and blame Netanyahu. But even though they're all the same, but the Americans do, you know, there is a way out for them to, to end this. Okay, so I know, I know that you have to go and are waiting for you in the other channel, but just one uh, quick thing. I mean, so I'm, anyway, I'm showing. So in case, so you say Iran does attack, which will be, America has said, let me just come take you to the uh, previous uh, page, and America has uh, predicted it's going to be in the next 24 to 48 hours, yeah? So it's going to be very imminent, according to them, whereas... Uh, and Reuters constantly, that's the one, yeah? It's like Times of Israel says it's going to be the next uh, 24 to 48 hours. But then Reuters says it's going to be here and there. Who would know they, Iran? They've been saying that for the last eight, nine days. 
They've been saying 24, 48 hours, a senior American unnamed intelligence source has said. To, so, yes, of course, every, if I, every day I say within the next 24, 48 hours, there's going to be attack. Ultimately, there's going to be an attack uh, in, you know, uh, within one of those 24, 48 hour periods. They're talking nonsense. They've been saying this from uh, days ago. Anyone can just go and look this up. And you, Western intelligence obviously does not have any uh, real information. They have no idea about what but, Iran but, intends to do. But, 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 but just what, make, make it clear. I mean, I think in Iran... When Iran intends to do it. I, I think in Iran, no one knows as well. I mean, apart from very top people, I think possibly the, the leadership and the command, the commander, the Without top commanders. Doubt, yeah? Yes, I have no idea. I do know that Iran is prepared for a second wave and a third wave, and uh, that they are, they have their assets all available. But what what will be the scope of the strike, and how will they punish the regime for for its crime? I don't know. I know that they have much more prepared in case the the Israeli regime does the stupid thing and and strikes back. But uh, I don't know, and I'm absolutely certain that uh, Western news agencies and Western uh, officials don't know. And when they say 24 to 48 hours, maybe today, tonight, or tomorrow morning, or tomorrow night, there will be an attack. But they're not correct, because they've been saying 24 or 48 hours for the last eight days. And as I said, to, two days from now, if there isn't a... a, a, a uh, retaliation from Iran. Again, someone else will say yes within the next 24 hours. So ultimately, someone's prediction, if they keep repeating it, will turn out to be correct. But in reality, that's not a correct prediction. So the, the, the final thing is, I mean, there's been like talks inside Iran by uh, by few people. I mean, uh, and also like, I don't know, by different things. Axios, for example, I'm trying to like bring it up now, saying that Iran warns the U.S. to stay out of fight with Israel or face attack on troops. Uh, uh, anyway, that's not... So they've been, they've been saying that how the attack happened, and now they are coming the direction of people's anger inside Iran to his own uh, kind of allies. So uh, Ali Waez from... Uh, I think I, I found this one, I think. Ali Waez from... He used to be with Crisis Group, and he was very close to Bob, uh, Rob, Rob Mali. He has said that Russia has given the uh, possibly has given the uh, info to to Israel, and so basically has betrayed Iran because Russia wants to draw draw Iran into a war because a destroyed Iran is beneficial for. Russia and China. So they would like to weaken Iran. What, what does this person say? What information have they given to Israel? Uh, about the information of the presence of the commanders in, in the embassy. So they, they want to bring the blame from America with supporting the actual uh, the actual uh, perpetrator of the attack. Well, of course, look, that's that's obviously nonsense. And he's what if he if that's what he said, then obviously it's propaganda. And he's trying to draw attention away from the, the facts. The embassy, anyone who's seen the Iranian embassy in, in Damascus knows that it's uh, the gate, the front gate is on the main street. You, it's, there's, it's fair, everyone, anyone who goes in, in, there's, there's no way to hide the presence of people in the embassy. It's not a safe house. If a general goes inside, people will know that a general is inside. There are cameras all over the, the street. There are people. People walk by. There are taxis. There are, there are, uh, there are businesses. It's, it's not, you know, if they wanted to hide a person, it would be in a safe house somewhere in some corner in Damascus, in some building, in some apartment, in some underground place. This was the embassy building. There was nothing for the Russians to give. There was no secret presence of people inside the Iranian embassy. The embassy is the last place in the world that you would go and hide a person. So that's nonsense. What this person, if that's what he said, I, 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 I find it hard to believe that he would say such nonsense. But if that's what he said, it's obviously a part of the Western propaganda. This is the Israeli regime that carried it out. It's possible, quite possible, that the Americans knew it because they're so close to each other. But this is not something, how would he know that the Russians gave information to the Israelis? Is he working for the Russian intelligence agency or, the, or Mossad? 
uh, the only way he would be able to know is if he's working for one of these two agencies. But obviously, that's nonsense. This is the embassy yeah. building. I've been inside many times. There's no way that you can hide people inside an embassy be, uh, building. The, the other kind of... Uh, just Especially the highest, oh. high profile people. Okay, actually, I found this one. And and the, the final one is they are saying that Syrian, uh, part of Syrian army and the Ba'ath regime, the Ba'ath party, they are not happy of Iranian military presence there. So they are the ones who have given the info to, to Israel. So in a sense, I mean, I'm saying that like... The, so everyone, in other words, exactly. these anti-Iranian propagandists, if Persian media in the West, they're blaming everyone for the the death of the murder of the generals except for the israelis and the and their western allies uh, it's sort of like how the west tries to blame hamas and islamic jihad for the genocide, genocide in gaza it it doesn't work but in any case i think it also shows the 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 weakness of their propaganda model the inconsistencies that lie uh, within their propaganda propaganda model. And also, I think there's a strong sense of desperation when the propaganda gets very bad. I think it's a sign that things are not going well. That's, that's fine. Just I'm just showing that uh, in, uh, for the sake of uh, documentation, because the previous one was not the right tweet. This one, Ali Weiss says, an, a Russian agent it has been it has been involved in Israeli attack to Damascus. There are uh, suggestions in Iran that the information regarding the presence of uh, the top commanders of IRGC possibly was given from yeah. Russian side to Israel. And Russia and China think that a military conflict uh, will not lead to the toppling of Iranian regime. However, it will leave Iran as a destroyed country, which is uh, which is going to be more dependent on them. And so I'm going to finish with yeah, this Yeah, so one. basically what these Persian uh, propagandists and Persian media are saying is that Everyone is bad except for the West. The Chinese are evil. The Russians are evil. They want to destroy Iran. It's the West that's imposing sanctions. It's the West that's imp uh, helping Israel, giving it the Israel the weapons to, to kill across the region, to bomb the Iranians. It's the West that, can, that has blocked the UN Security Council from condemning the strike on the Iranian embassy. But it's everyone else that's there, the bad people. It's the Syrians that are bad. It's the Russians that are bad. It's the Iraqis that are bad. It's, it's you know, I, it's, it's clear that this propaganda model is basically to somehow uh, I finished to, it with, to I've... create division but it, it doesn't work anymore. The, it, the things are so open and blatant and so ugly what the West is doing that only the most naive of people are those who are just uh, obsessed with the West. Besides them, uh, no one else is going to believe this nonsense. I'll finish with this, like, exactly with this, uh, with this, like, difference and uh, kind of divergence of the news inside Iran, as they say, Iran is a colony of Russia and China who has lost any form of independence because the mullahs want to give away, the sell away the country to Russia and China. Outside, it's one after another article that Iran has become a hegemon, a hegemonic power, superpower of the West Asia, who is trying to bring every other nation under its influence or domination, as they say. Yeah? And so, in so one day, so one day, they're saying that it is Iran that is helping Russia and Ukraine, and it is Iranian weapons that is uh, undermining the Ukrainian armed forces. And on, on another day, they're saying it is the Russians that are controlling Iran. Again, these narratives and these, there, there are so many inconsistencies slave, in these narratives. <laughs> and they're, they're so self-contradictory that it's quite stunning. But these people fail to see it because they're so obsessed and so hostile that uh, they'll believe anything that's negative, even though if, the, the, if it contradicts one another. That's fantastic. Thank you very much, Mr. Marandi, for your precious yeah. time, because I know you are a one-man army and you are going to go from hopping from one interview to another one to <laughs> undo part of this massive storm of propaganda, misinformation, disinformation, fake news, lies, and contradictory things. And also the amazing form of investigative journalism in which three or four hands come in from underneath and they show glasses moving and that becomes the 
celebration of 85 million Iranians for the assassination of their military commanders. By the way, just going to say this before going, while in Israel, people are scared and they've been run, rushing towards shopping centers to fill their house with water and things. In Iran, life is going on. I've been just talking to my parents and to my friends in Tehran and to two of them in Isfahan. They say, what? Why would we be worried? I said, the possible kind of looming war with Israel. I said, what war? Yeah? And they were like more worried about other stories inside inside the country. So, uh, and the other thing is, so that's why in a sense, their, their, kind of, uh, their rented mouth of the puppets, as we remember from Iraq war back in 2003, are telling the West that you just enter Iran, as, start the war, the public will celebrate you. They will give you flowers and Iranian... People are not with the state. But let me just tell you, it is true that at the moment, especially in the last couple of years after the sanction, yeah, the may, maybe parts of the public are, ha have genuine legitimate discontent. But since last week, I've seen even people who are after regime change, but genuinely angry because Iran's soil was attacked. So when it comes to question of national security, there is, I, I couldn't believe that myself, despite all these propaganda machines around Iran, this, <sighs> The, 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 there is a massive unity around the question of national security and Iran's uh, territorial integrity. So I think that's a very wrong message that the Israeli lobby in Washington is giving their politician that will be playing not with fire, they will be playing with much worse than that. And so, yeah, so it, this it is a blessing in disguise when they believe their own propaganda because they constantly miscalculate and they fail. Uh, but in addition to that, I think that um, actually uh, people across the world and, and even those in Iran who have been influenced by Western narratives in the past, uh, a, a, a minority, but a part of the Iranian population, uh, among my students, among my colleagues, there are people who we have discussions uh, and some of them are, are, you know, hate the Islamic Republic and uh, I, I had a student uh, last week in class saying, very seriously, he wasn't like exaggerating, he was saying this is the worst regime in the world and even like North Korea, which I've never been to, I can't comment on, but is 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 not like this. And and I was just saying, well, you know, I was thinking, I was sort of smiling to myself saying, well, if it's so scary, then you wouldn't say this in, in, in class, you know, like in, in Saudi Arabia or in Qatar or in the Emirates or in you know, other neighboring countries uh, to the north and in the Republic of Azerbaijan and Afghanistan. And, uh, you know, could you say these things or in, in Central Asian countries? Yeah. But but the point is that the West has so effectively demolished their uh, credibility. They have destroyed their soft power through this unprecedented horrible, evil genocide that they're carrying out in Gaza, that people are across the world and even these people and even these young people in Iran are coming to see exactly. or will gradually see yeah. uh, the they, truth they, that, they really though, get... that that whatever criticisms we may mm -hmm. have of Iran and, and many are valid, there are many problems in Iran, but the West is just... morally inferior, you know, until yeah, six of, no comparison. Until sixth of, sixth of October, me and you and people like us who are critical of like I don't know Americans' intervention and like uh, uh, liberal democracy as a form of like I don't know form of velvet revolution. It's we not like, even a democracy. We were, we were this on, is, that's all nonsense. We were on the defensive, and now I think this attack in the last 185 days they really disarmed their <laughs> their kind of the army of. Uh, pro-American forces yes, they, in they've Iran. exposed they themselves them. to the world and to their own people. And every single hour that this genocide continues, they're only making it worse for themselves and they're entrenching public opinion across the world against themselves and they're awakening further people in Western countries. Is, is, is and this throwing, is ultimately mm. what is going to bring an end to the Israeli regime. The Israeli regime has been so that. discredited and is seen as so illegitimate and brutal and evil and like the Nazi regime uh, in the mid uh, 20th century that it's it's not going to survive. I don't know if it's going to collapse in 
two years or ten years, but this regime is not going well, also, to Also, the survive. West, I think, the, the West as a whole and America as a, America throw away its 75 years of investment on its soft power army and the mechanism yes, of its soft power. Absolutely. So it's yes. gone. It's gone beyond it's repair. Come to an end. It's gone beyond repair. All right. Thank you very much for. I hope that to see you soon. And thank you. Before going, I'm going to ask everyone to like the program because that's that's the way we can go through the algorithms. And Dr. Marandi is going to ask you on my behalf. Like the sure. program. Write comment. Like and the program. Like the program. Help us to grow in English as well as we've done in Farsi. And we see you soon with another episode. Bye and good night.